Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching this note-by-note -note dissection of Wagner's Der Ring des Nibblungen. This video is 11th in a series of 16 devoted to Die Valkyr Act 1. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly literature, it's a massive journey I hope you'll take with me, one I'm dedicated to finishing. For an explanation of who I am and more on the reasons for this series, please check the preface video, first in a group of six building a foundation to this in-depth analysis. Before diving into this video, you may want to watch The Case for Erda, The Case Against Photon, and The Case for Loge, which present my views on how and why Wagner manipulates his musical syntax as he does, in the process identifying key morphemes which I believe define the entire work. You'll find explanations for why the terms leitmotif, motif, and motive have been replaced by morpheme, module, and cell in the chapter titled Music as Text. Links are provided in the comments below. My aim is to mount subsequent videos each week with breaks of approximately a month between each drama's acts until the entire ring is analyzed. We pick up where we left off, Sieglinde coming to Siegmund after she's drugged Hunding, page 73, stave 2, in Dover's full score. Hunding's rhythm with its nighting threat, having faded on timpani, a last Valhalla ash interval pulse with its key change to G, ushers in a pale ray of hope, first oboe sighing a ghost of the Velsung sorrows, a breve flute clarinet C major chord in support. The woodwind's lingering breve semi breve five pedal chord, tonic of the key shift to G major, underpins cellos climbing hurriedly through the Zieglinde variant with its suggestion of her peril mixed with courage, to emphasize that the prior soaring module expresses her sympathy. The Velsung maiden hurries to Siegmund from the Nidings bedchamber, effectively throwing over life with Hunding for that of a hunted outlaw. Her syntax ends by rising a fourth, woodwind pedal chord shifted to diminished minor seventh, its gentility tempering Zieglinde's fraught vocal intervals as she hails their guest to a portentous downward seventh and rising tritone. Siegmund briefly dispels the minor shadows, asking who comes to a few a cappella notes roughly outlining fate, punctuated by a violin-viola major mode quaver chord. This initiates the act's penultimate quasi-recitative, among the last in the ring as a whole. After this, it's impetus building into their protracted love scene. Zieglind identifies herself to chord notes punctuated by a string waver chord, her demand that he listen to her a static triplet and third descent, followed by another quaver string punch. Explaining over octavo low string semi breve dotted minim that she's drugged Hunding's nightcap, her hasty line moves through static notes into a mild chagrin pulse on melody notes and third descent. Then a reverse chord note lift, her downbeat crotchet inspiring bassoons to whisper a minor semi breve chord. Over it, her phrase continues unbroken with three more static notes, a third lift into another three static pitches to finish on a last reverse chord note pulse, triggering bassoon's next semi brevi pedal chord's harmonic shift. Resting a crotchet, she resumes a third above on the measure's third beat, holding her semi brevi through a staccato string quaver to stress the urgency of Siegmund taking this chance to flee, a string quaver punching her tritone fall into another reverse chord note lift to descend a third, her bold sixth lift making this a ringless distortion. Botan doesn't intend his Velsung to depart without that sword with which the gods destined him to slay Fafner, thus get back the ring. A crotchet after her last note's downbeat, Siegmund makes it clear he has no intention of leaving. Heil mach mich dein Nan. On an anti-barrier, Votan's hope of salvation hear the Volsungs, two string quaver chords punctuating the hero's first note, sustained an enthusiastic minim. 
The recitative begins to disintegrate with Sieglinde's a cappella phrases laced in echoing orchestral modules as she reveals the unique weapon available to her new love, which, should he win it, would make him den Hersten Helden. Modules separating her initial four phrases rise on seemingly incidental cells built out of familiar syntax, their various later guises peppering the epic as it expands. A rising viola line, though it shapes the next two interstitial modules, never again repeats in precisely this form, so can't be classed a recurrent morpheme. Yet, it's constructed entirely from pre-existing modules, chord notes, reverse chord notes, and heroic melody note variants. It seems an unconscious device, one of Newman's Wagnerian tics. But similar rushing string modules often lace dramatic high points when female characters experience intense excitement or stress, this one soon generating a bona fide recurrent morphine. Bassoon's horns thread it with a corded static ash interval, meaning the giant thump, to which Sieglinde responds with the Welsung bounce, followed by a retrograde heroic melody note pulse and chord note opposition, reversing that in the prior string module. Its next variant answers her, rising on second violins this time, capped by an abandonment triad, clarinet supplementing bassoon's corded static ash interval to make it a high interval on a fourth, whose deep significance the rush of the moment obscures. Sieglinde responds by gliding down extended reverse melody notes capped in reverse chord notes, inspiring first violins violas to another still more forceful variant capped by a prescient air to seventh plunge, first oboe joining woodwind's horns in a low ash interval. Sieglinde lifts with its fourth ascent on the next downbeat, again sliding down extended reverse melody notes to emphasize the spear's shadow behind her words, expanded by an initial static ash interval and static repetitions of its other pitches, no longer a cappella but supported by horn woodwind counterpoint, built from reverse melody notes in top lines, opposed by melody notes in lower. Quaver string staccato chords on first and third beats of both measures. This triggers first violins to race through a new variant, still rifled with chord notes and one reverse chord note pulse. The most divergent version yet of these rushing string modules, it later comes to epitomize many of those which rise and fall in this convoluted way. It begins on melody notes to leap a jubilant rising octave, parse its first two chord note strophes as extended reverse melody notes, then sink out of its final chord note strophe to a cell not unlike the ring fragment. This fervid line's horn woodwind support again opposes melody notes, string cording now a low ash interval, then a reverse. Returning to quasi a cappella as she rises a third, Sieglinde reports, Dem Starkes allein ward sie bestimmt, sung to that inverted heroic melody note cell with which Siegmund earlier mused on his twin's beauty, here transformed from poignancy to heroism, which she completes ironically with spare opposing extended melody notes launched by soft quaver string chords on second and third beat. Her vocal sparks yet another sword iteration, here returned to its wonted C major together with new embryonic syntax. Topping bass trumpets, vivid sword pulse, a distinctive horn woodwind module delicately punctuated by string quavers, moves through a static ash interval filigree, melody note lift, and final rising arc, a pointed reversal of Fafner's taunt over the gods' aging, taken together the nascent dawn of what soon blossoms into a short-lived yet potent morpheme of its own. It fires the Velsung maid's wordless anticipation of her story, which she adjures him to attend on a Velsung bounce, a cell already common to both twins' vocals. She sinks from it to form that 6-4 arpeggio of her brother's early appreciation, which she finishes with a chagrin strophe, its melody notes capped in diminished seventh plunge, Erda's inspiration. 
Her yarn certainly turns all Sigmund's ideas on their head, seemingly in Wotan's favor, but ultimately to the Vala's advantage. Prefaced by a last-string pizzicato, the stroke of a bard's harp, Sieglinde begins the tale of her loveless wedding, knit through with the developing theme of Wotan's clandestine manipulations. Its first bar's monotone delivery, a last gasp of the Meister's quasi-recitative style to evoke a scaldic poet's lay. Writing the E minor string pedal chords breve extended a semi breve into the next measure, Sieglinde conjures the wedding guests, her ghost of the Velsung race's initial module begun on a static ash interval, fourth bounce, and melody notes. Only one analyst notes this odd touch, yet its logic works on several levels, establishing a scaldic feel with the dark module perfectly catching the following narrative's epic tone. While one can't equate the celebration's brutal nightings with Velsung nobility, the syntax does hint they have their own brand of heroic honor, albeit profoundly sexist, her phrase, Der Männer Zippe implying that, apart from her, only males are welcome at that feast. Sieglinde hurries through a pair of chagrin strophes, the second only partial, whose concatenation also produces a stunted barrier, Loge's dubious reliability with a sense of helpless peril like that faced by Mima and Albrecht at the hands of the Rheingold gods. From a quaver rest, she lifts a pathetic sixth string semi brevi pedal harmony altering as she describes her unwilling betrothal, her static notes capped with the fourth descent and, after her semi quaver rest, a sinking third into her Velsung Blood's reverse melody notes. Her last pitch shifts the string pedal to a diminished minor seventh crotchet as she bounces a cappella through tritones to rise a third and fall through chord notes into a fourth descent. Viola's cellos sigh a reverse air to chord pulse, releasing its initial minimum on the second chord's quaver to prepare Zieglinde's a cappella phrase, her sadness in the midst of the celebration, sinking through a reverse ash interval on chord notes, dropping a tritone, lifting through reverse chord notes, and a third, then concluding with more chord notes. Isolated portentously between two quaver rests, the initial tapped by a quaver string chord, she intones Ein Fremder to that unmistakable Velsung bounce, finishing her news of his arrival at the wedding with the major mode quasi fate strophe, a presentiment with its own role to play over the next few minutes. This mysterious grey-clad guest, Wotan in his wanderer guise, the Velsung maiden goes on to depict, leaving no doubt of it. With the final note of her previous phrase, the beat shifts to E major triple time, forever banishing quasi-recitative. The following extended Valhalla syntax is a touch no analyst misses, though one commentator finds in it slightly more than mere affirmation of the intruder's real identity. Here, some music proclaims what the central characters do not as yet know. Underlying Sieglinde's narrative is the Valhalla motif indicating Wotan's unseen presence as author, conductor, and producer of the fateful drama. A full discussion on this point awaits Act 2, but just as does Volsunga Saga's Odin, Wagner's god throws down a gauntlet to frustrate lesser mortals' attempts to crossbreed with his favored demigod race. In both cases, he might have as easily foregone all the grief this public display invites by simply handing the weapon to his descendant away from mortal eyes. A fierce god of war, the mythic Odin, seems pleased, or at least content, with the protracted vendetta he triggers. The Meister, however, severely dovetails this conflict into Act One's three characters, his main purpose to increase our sympathies for the Velsung twins. But, as Act Two clarifies, the result has unexpected consequences for Wotan's plans. Or so traditional analytic literature would have it, though whether that's entirely accurate remains to be seen. 
als Author, Conductor und Producer of the Fateful Drama, Photon seems remarkably inept, unless he has a deeper motivation for thrusting the sword into the ash tree with his own hands, never mind before all eyes at his demigod offspring's wedding. Two complete horn bassoon Valhalla Part 1 strophes are bracketed in trombone parentheses. The first, a dotted quaver chord, then world ash intervals begun with the static, the rest alternating between inverted, low, and static, their variety underlining the god's dubious manipulation. Typical of most vocals strung around Valhalla syntax, Sieglindus consists entirely of tonic pitches, commencing in the middle of the first Valhalla iteration with a double impact a third below her former pitch, to descend a fourth thus creating retrograde reverse melody notes, followed by static which she completes on a rising sixth. She then rests for the entirety of the second Valhalla pulse, resuming only on its final crotchet. Here, as in the morphine complex's Rheingold treatment, its second half's constantly echoing erda melody notes take stage, six iterations in all. With trombone's inverted ash interval finishing the second pulse, Sieglinde resumes her next phrase entirely on static B natural, finished with a static interval. From her quaver rest, she goes on to lift a fourth into another Velsung bounce, trombone's inverted ash interval prefiguring her own to stress the phrase Augen Eines, Wotan's doom-laden visage. Up to this point, the harmonic texture repeats those diatonic progressions already familiar from Rheingold. Confirmation the god's ironclad grip on natural power remains unbroken. While the fifth Valhalla extension takes the wanted harmonic lift of that syntax's fifth pulse, its last iteration modulates into the minor mode of a Valhalla part one strophe, followed by another modulatory pulse, strings adding weight to the melody note portion with each. The subtly vacillating harmony emphasizes what Sieglinde describes vocally, the unease the stranger inspires in the assembled nightings. She rises a third to move through a low ash interval on a fourth, linger a minimum on the word angst, then descend that same fourth, making the phrase an elongated Velsung bounce, which she caps with reverse chord notes and a final drop of a third on the next Valhalla Part 1 strophe's downbeat. After a crotchet rest, she lifts another fourth through a low ash interval, from whose upper minimum she descends a more dramatic sixth on Menner into a static interval, its own capping minimum leading to her rise and fall on that same sixth, one finished by chord notes. This inverted distortion of Velsung race is especially revealing, given she cites the awesome visitor's Mechtiges Droin. While the harmony's restless upward modulations add weight to this apparition, Viola's cellos underline its impact by creeping in to take over the Valhalla extensions, horns falling, rising octave pulses, more subtly buttressing the syntax with a reminder of the power here at stake. As a side note, horn voicings evoke their similar movements in Götterdämmerung, when the Norns describe Wotan approaching the world ash to rest his spear, with the ash interval juxtapositions typical of Valhalla syntax, the high with their sense of power set against the direst of inverted. What makes this passage unusual are the two rare pure ash intervals, sandwiched into its texture. The first harmonized by first and second horns, the second in first horn alone bringing the Valhalla syntax to a close. No audience can hear this detail, yet by including it, Wagner seems to hint at the natural energy Wotan carries with him so he may in time pass it to his son, an idea the Act I finale gives sufficient voice that attendees with sharp ears will almost certainly notice. 
The final Valhalla Part 1 iteration concludes on the next measure's downbeat, a brass woodwind dotted crotchet leaving Viola's cellos to themselves as they sink in a gentle chromatic sequence of dotted minim chords varied in the fourth measure by first cello suspensions, a passing ghost of magic sleep, an embryonic foretaste of wanderer syntax. Not made definitive until Act 3, it's already prefigured in Rheingold to disturb another unorthodox and not entirely happy coupling, both facilitated and frustrated by Wotan. Here, it suggests the tender emotions linking this strange guest to Sieglinde as they share a look, shadow of that empathy Erda and Loge mean to spread in the world. Ironically, though powerful in the Velsung Maiden, it's paltry in her father, who comes not to rescue but to doom her in service of his lust for the ring. Sieglinde's vocal roughly doubles the viola cello spear-like descent as she tells how she alone responded to the stranger's fierce look with tender sadness. Her phrase's tail lifts a fourth, making it an anti-barrier, which violas answer by opposing Erda melody notes with an almost painful harmonic shift. The Velsung Maiden abruptly responds with a Velsung love distortion, its court notes on the word Tränen, punched with a still more agonized harmonic sting dissonance on a doubling parallax to the words Und Trost zugleich. She transforms the morphine's last notes into an abandonment triad, mark of this dubious trust, capped by the reverse melody notes of her race. Strings double her melody note pulse at a slight parallax as their cadential harmony shifts to a gentle major, a striking mix of Velsung racial syntax with that of love, betrayal, and the Vala's mysterious hand. Not until Act Two's monologue do audiences think of Erida again, reminded by Wotan's expedition to wrest from the Earth Mother that knowledge he so desperately needs. But the work's chronology shows her writ large over Act One, the immortal's visit to her having taken place well before Sieglinde's wedding. Ostensibly to dispel Erda's Rheingold mysteries, the god commits what amounts to yet another rape, this one overtly sexual, its product the Valkyries, Brunhilde first among them, whom he then sets to gathering Valhalla's heroes. Where the Velsungs fall in this timeline is unclear, but considering Erda's revelation of Hagen's birth, the god likely sires his demigod answer to that challenge soon after his Valkyrie's birth. The wedding episode's place in that history suggests Wotan, his plans for world control already well in motion, comes to Hunding's feast with a fully decided strategy for leading Zygmunt to this spot in order to liberate the sword. Such tidiness casts the immortal in a still less favorable light, an impression Wotan's behavior at the wedding feast only strengthens. He makes no secret of his affection for Sieglinde, yet doesn't bother rescuing her after placing the sword, or reveal it's her own brother who'll at last come for it. These deliberate omissions are especially glaring, considering the god's emotional sexual exploitation of the other women in his life, Freke and Freya in Rheingold, then Erda, and soon after, his neglected Velsung mother and daughter. Sympathy for the Velsung Maiden's tears should arouse profound doubts about her blind faith's advisability, though unaware of these deeper narrative questions, first-time audiences don't even learn the young pair are twins until Act's conclusion, only fitting together the other puzzle pieces once the god reveals his plans more fully in Act 2. For the moment, at least, we're entirely in Sieglinde's vulnerable, uninformed camp, accepting her tender affection at face value as it's answered by the sword on a single, understated horn, the morpheme's intensity swelling from deceptive gentility into brilliant triumph as, one by one, the other three horns join a chained trio of horn iterations. Each progressively supplements the module's tonic harmonies, the first two on E major 1, the third shifting to 4, the last slipping dramatically into A minor. 
With this syntax's heraldic unfolding after a minim dotted quaver rest, Zieglinde describes the god casting her a glance, after which he reveals the sword itself to those gathered. The first of her three phrases echoes her immediately prior rising third and reverse melody notes, her second after a quaver rest embellishing it by rising a heroic fifth into a triplet static ash interval that extends into more reverse melody notes. After a crotchet rest, she joins the harmonic shift with a falling rising sign resembling the world ash melody and its Rheingold echo when Wotan praises Valhalla, its rising arpeggio similar to the giant's. The harmony ascends to climax as it shifts to the bright C major of Wotan's hopes and a reprise of the sword's Rheingold appearance, whose differences from that original incarnation are as enlightening as its similarities. Sieglinde's low ash interval on a third rides the horn's thrilling A minor harmonic shift, which she follows with a static interval, itself elated to yet another low on a third, her arpeggio sketching an abandonment triad, its irony especially palpable at this moment. Supporting these last two intervals, first trumpet rings out the sword, moving into a bundle resembling Valhalla Part 4, Cook's Valhalla Cadence. Zieglinde's vocal doubles first, second oboes, and third horn with the remarkable touch of a third consecutive low ash interval, an unbroken chain confirming the immortal's tainted power. Its heroic fifth precisely duplicates that crowning touch in Rheingold's Valhalla cadence, itself the module's echo as first heard when Albrecht rips the gold from its place in scene one, along with an intimation in his curse, one more precisely repeated by Erda as she issues her final warning against holding the ring. Portentously, it's here the syntax deviates from its Rheingold incarnation as it moves through a 5-1 cadence. Sieglinde intones a slightly truncated version of the god turn, opposing that of the giants, here altered to highlight its erda opposing reverse melody notes, mark of the Velsung's racial fertility. The god turn has sounded throughout this act, but its least expected precursor sounds in Loge's vocal concluding his panegyric with the Rhine Maiden's hope that Wotan will return their gold, which paradoxically is the sword's ultimate result. This major deviation from the complex's Rheingold version also eliminates its Freya module, confirmation that love plays no part in this imperious deed. Another shadow thrown across the twins' growing bond. Punched by the United String Choir's quasi Nibelung grace, Mita reverting to Dupo, a final luminously pure C major trumpet iteration of the sword rounds out this modular bundle, brass woodwind brevet petal chord sustaining it with religious fervor. Possibly either that moment the Meister visualized Warfather thrusting in the sword, or a cinematic pullback from it lodged in the tree. This sequence appears to resolve the syntactic mystery bequeathed by the sword's cryptic Rheingold appearance, and few can doubt what the god intends for the weapon. But it's not quite so simple. Wagner's far different objectives complicate the myth's simple revenge tale in which Siegmund himself attends the wedding feast, watches Odin place the sword, then bests the assembled in drawing it from the tree. In altering this straightforward exposition, the Velsung somehow turns up at the very spot where he may seize both sword and lost sister. Krebil's doubter whispers, So, this guy just happens to come to a joint that just happens to have his dead sword stuck in a tree, which just happens to be where his lost sister lives. Most productions don't bother over this glaring procession of coincidences, though Lenhoff's business as Act One begins at least makes an effort, Photon brandishing his spear to throw open Hunding's door for the Velsung to enter. In Act Two, while demolishing her consort's schemes, Fricka addresses the problem, but only vaguely. 
Willst du es leugnen, dass nur deine List in Lockte vor Ehre stand? But lacking a stage indication less ambiguous than Lehnhoff's, this flies unnoticed over an audience's head. By altering the narrative's hub, revenge traded for the complications of empathetic love, Wagner forces a much greater burden on what in the myths are tangential incestuous threads. Ring analysts tend to minimize this incest element, questioning whether Wotan arranges for his children to fall in love from the start, the general consensus being that he doesn't. By recapturing his sister in order to become her lover, Wotan is implicating both of them in adultery and incest. This was not what the ruler of the gods intended. He did not reckon with the possibility that spring as a force of nature would confound his cleverly devised plan. In my view, the god certainly does intend this coupling, and some few commentators agree. Sigmund is transported to find that the heroic race of the Volsungs need neither perish nor be corrupted by a lower strain. Wotan's dream for his children, as brother and sister, to fall in love and produce a son who therefore would be all the more especially flesh of his flesh, since the boy's father and mother both would be Wotan's offspring, a son who had only one set of grandparents thus might resemble his grandfather, Wotan, more than even his own son could. Sieglinde's recent comment about Wotan subtly reinforces this conclusion. Auf mich blickt er und blitzte auf jene, als ein Schwert in Händen erschwan. Warfather's loathing for the Nidings suggests he already intends Siegmund to seize both woman and sword, a racial gauntlet thrown down in an unworthy tribe's face to echo the mythic Signy's contempt for King Segir's bloodline. Together with the plot details just discussed, this explains why commentators must struggle to exonerate Wotan, of which more is said in due course. Without naming the god, Sieglind repeats what must be his pronouncement to the assembled, that the sword belongs to him who draws it from the tree, atop an echoing pair of three noble chords, a moment as dignified as it is numinous. Strings take the first group through heroic melody notes, brass woodwinds phrasing the second as that module's first inversion. With strings, her four static notes lift a fourth on the word Stahl, from which she descends a sixth through an ominous inverted ash interval, her phrase ended with the fourth descent. She joins brass woodwinds after a quaver rest a third above her previous phrase to rise a third from three static notes and finish with a reverse ash interval on a tragic fifth, the distinguishing modules of her simple line ratified in their potential tragedy as horns complete the orchestral phrase as a still more sinister inverted ash interval, this one echoing the plunging sixth of her vocal. Whether by accident or design, the term steel has special meaning for Wotan's sword, another reason one wishes staging paid greater attention to the weapon's design and handling, to give it more impact whenever it's seen. While steel was made even in the ancient world, it was readily available only in China, India, and the Middle East. Roman soldiers carried steel weapons, but Teutonic and Norse warriors relied primarily on iron, a situation which lasted until the Merovingian dynasty, roughly the 8th century AD. This would make the god's weapon a unique commodity, qualifying its divine origin, a question particularly important in Siegfried, and one which any production should address here in Valkyr in order to maintain believability across the epic's course. But stagecraft has been especially lax in this one instance, to the detriment of the tradition as a whole. After Fermata holds the last pretentious brass woodwind chord, its downbeat tweaked by contrabass pizzicato quaver, Sieglinde recalls the futile efforts of guests to pull out the sword. 
with only a viola cello dotted minim chord to sustain the quasi folk song symmetry of her initial phrase, she lifts from a double impact into reverse chord notes, echoed after a third lift by chord notes proper, then proceeds through static notes to repeat the same chord note opposition. Her next phrase leaps up a fourth into the next measure, where she again falls a sixth, recalling the part that interval plays in her version of Wotan's pronouncement. From that, she lifts another fourth, punched by a viola cello quaver pizzicato chord, to sink on chord notes, capped by another plunging fifth. Her crotchet rest punctuated with the cadential viola cello quaver pizzicato chord. Arco strings, lacking contrabasses, intone an apt falling spear line as her folk-like vocal first surrounds chord notes with descending thirds, then after a heroic rising fifth, yet another plunge of a sixth, this one tailed on more chord notes. After a semi-quaver rest, she ascends yet another sixth to sink through a Welterb triad on the word Stärksten. An allusion to that racial test the knightings fail in their repeated fruitless attempts to draw the sword. She caps this phrase with the chord note opposition to leap up still another sixth into the word Stahl, further tying together Wotan's powers while including just a hint of the Velsung prowess these lesser creatures lack. With the measures upbeat after a quaver rest, she rises from the sixth below on a third lift into an inverted ash interval on the same interval. Wotan's inspiration has percolated through Zygmunt's appeal for his sword, a phrase she concludes with extended reverse melody notes to finish her description of Nidings helpless against divine power. As noted, that falling spear-like module is slowly acquiring its own syntactic relevance to the Velsung race, one to bear important fruit in Siegfried. Trombones support her vocal in a soft semi brevi chord, while first trumpet initiates a muted sword iteration, its rising forth atop her last three notes, which amount to the reverse melody notes already associated with Velsung racial potency. Sieglind arrests the dotted semi breve to allow the sword full voice as it passes through a tender yet vaguely tragic harmonic progression. On the upbeat following its last note, she begins a tenth above her last pitch to fall yet again on a sixth, move through the ominous ringlust module, then finish with a tragic plunging fifth all of it supported by trombone's cadential formula, as she assures the Velsung the sword mutely awaits its master. That's it for now. My aim is to keep these videos close to a half an hour instead of the longer ones which make this too much of an endurance test. The next video picks up where this one leaves off, Zieglinda having concluded her wedding narrative, page 81, top stave of Dover's full score. As always, thanks for watching, and please do leave your comments below. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there's a lot more to come.